Consulting Logistics, presented by Aborn and Company. I'm your host, Tim Dooner. Thanks for press and play. On previous episodes of this show, we've covered blockchain from the perspective of the players, both old and new in the field. We've talked about how blockchain works with IBM and its role in data capture with Freight Network. Well, today, Brian Glick, founder and CEO of Chain.io, joins us to talk about the practical usage of blockchain and how that applies to shippers. And that's Brian dialing in right now. Let's welcome him on the air. Brian, thank you so much for joining us on Consulting Logistics today. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Brian Glick, if our listeners are not familiar, he was with OHL for 11 years, working in software development, and ultimately became the Senior Director of Global Freight Management IT Solutions. You spent five years with Vandegrift. There you were Senior Vice President. And in 2017, you founded the company that you're with now, Chain.io, and that website is Chain.io. Tell us a little bit about this road you traveled and how it all came together with you founding Chain.io. So I started in the industry, actually on the customs brokerage side of the house. And in the early 2000s, as part of a broker that was acquired by OHL called uh, Barthco, we spun off a company called Freight Tech. And we did some of the original global supply chain visibility platforms on the web back when we would actually make phone calls to suppliers and ask them if they had an internet connection. Uh, So quite a different world than the one we live in today. And then through acquisitions and and all sorts of things, stayed very involved in that that side of kind of the connectivity, whether it was running sales teams or running IT teams or developing uh, global trade management software. And through that whole journey uh, and all those companies you mentioned, always was very frustrated by how hard it is if you are a shipper to onboard new freight forwarders, new customs brokers, or if you are a service provider, how hard it is to onboard new shippers. And that every time everybody wanted to work together, it was like we started from scratch. And we said, can you do FTP? Can you do an API? Well, I have a 30-year-old AS400 system, and I just signed up for this new AI platform, and the programmers weren't born when that system was created, and they have no idea what I'm talking about. (laughs) So we really built Chain.io to be the sort of neutral platform that allows us to help people who work at different levels of technology or different parts of the supply chain talk to each other more efficiently, which we think is going to have a big tie-in to uh, artificial intelligence systems and blockchain, which I know we'll be talking about today. What's your goal in the market with starting this company? Because I look at your background, right? And you have all this tech background. And I'm a big tech geek too. And you probably experience a lot of the same frustrations I have in supply chain. And that's that we're still coming of age in the tech sector. And it's been a slow process. Yeah. And I think part of it, we don't actually give ourselves enough credit sometimes that there is a lot of amazing tech. It's just very hard to get it all to work together. Uh, And that's really our goal is that, you know, if I'm taking credit cards at a convenience store, I don't think all the way from the beginning of how does Visa build up their network. I just know there are a series of different credit card processing devices that I can use and I pick one and I kind of am off and running. We kind of need to get there. We need to get to the spot where different layers of technology can work together a little bit better. Uh, And what's really hard is that this is a really super complicated industry. And there are thousands of things that fall into the world of supply chain as a whole. Uh, So our goal is to kind of be that Visa or MasterCard in the sense that people are using those systems to do all sorts of different things. And they just kind of quietly sit under the hood and smooth out the financial transaction. And we want to allow companies to decide what software they want to use, uh, multiple software packages, which service providers they want to use based on the quality of the tools, not based on the integration headaches that come along with them. So I go on chain.io. What's my experience? What is a shipper who goes to your site? What are they looking to do and what are you looking to provide them? We are plumbers, right? We're under the hood. So when you go on our website, you're learning about how we are going to take other tools that you want to use and make them work better together. 
So we don't build screens. There is no logging into our system, uh, short of some IT people in your company maybe looking at how some transactions moved around. But ultimately, it's about talking to us and saying, hey, you know, I was just talking to a, uh, a, a large wearing apparel company yesterday who has about five different major initiatives uh, going on, and they all involve the same data moving around. Right, they're doing foreign trade zones. They're selling into new retail channels. They're doing omni-channel work. And instead of looking at each of these projects and paying for modifications across all these systems, they come to us and we sit down with them and say, let's talk about the core data flows and figure out how to efficiently provide the data into all these other projects so that you're not spending millions of dollars modifying systems. And each system can kind of operate at its own, at its own level and in its own language. Well, one of the solutions that you guys have come up with is with blockchain, right? Yes. Could you define blockchain for us as you understand it and how you're applying it? Okay. So blockchain in uh, 10 seconds or less, (laughs) we'll go with is the uh, blockchain is a big, slow database that everyone shares. So instead of the way that today I have a copy of an arrival notice and you have a copy of arrival notice. We're both effectively looking at the same thing and nobody can change it. And once it's written down, it's written in stone and I can do an update to it, but you can always see the full audit history. So what we built on the blockchain is a tool called Vault. And it actually came out of a real experience that that I had where I was with a customs auditor and they were very uh, concerned because a client had used spreadsheets to generate invoices and they could not verify that in the six years in between when that spreadsheet happened and when the audit happened that nobody had changed the spreadsheet. So we built a system where if that spreadsheet had been uploaded into our vault, a stamp would have been written to the blockchain with a fingerprint of that spreadsheet. And you could have had empirical independent proof to that customs auditor that that spreadsheet had never been changed. And the day that it was received by that company, which has all sorts of impacts for things, you know, customs related, proof of delivery related, uh, proof of condition, uh, social compliance, all sorts of things where collecting information long before you need it because of an incident is super important. And the ability to prove that you haven't kind of messed with that data. Yeah, the single source of truth. This conversation is very prescient because just recently I ran into somebody and I was talking about blockchain and tech in the supply chain. And one thing that I really wanted to ask you about because he, and I wasn't aware of this, he was saying that one of the issues with blockchain is it can only do X amount of number of transactions per second. Is there a limit or a scalability issue with blockchain in that regard? Or was that guy just spouting out some nonsense? (laughs) The answer is it depends, uh, because that's always the fun answer. On the public blockchain, that's a big issue. And there are a lot of very smart people around the world working on various proposals to make it faster. But there is absolutely a limitation. If you build your own internal blockchains, you can kind of get around that. But a lot of the benefits of blockchains are doing them out in the open with lots of Uh, participants. And the reason is that every time you write a record to a public blockchain, everyone gets a copy. Everyone has to do all of this complicated processing to try to, to, to do all the things that make it secure. And that stuff takes a lot of electricity and a lot of time, and it's intentionally sort of slow. So what that means practically for people looking at use cases for the public blockchain especially is you're not going to take all of your purchase orders and all of your supply chain data and write it to the blockchain. You're going to be using it for very narrow cases. For instance, when we get these massive PDFs that might be you know, megabytes and megabytes of data, we boil that down into one 256 character fingerprint. And we just write that little bit to the blockchain. And we keep everything else, what is now called off-chain, right, in a traditional storage. And it's pairing those two things back up when the audit happens that makes the magic. We're not writing everyone's images all the way out to the blockchain. So, Brian, you, you mentioned data, though, in this mountain of data and, and supply chains now. Data isn't a receipt anymore. Data runs parallel with the physical aspect of your freight. And not every supply chain seems to understand that yet. But soon enough, they're going to have to. So what's the role of blockchain, though, in data capture? There's two roles, I would say. The first is this idea of traceability, that if you are writing information to a blockchain, then you can eliminate a lot of conflict 
uh, you can eliminate the idea that I said I sent you this document and you never received it. And now that shipment sat uh, at the port for a week. Who's got to pay for it? You know what happened. So you've eliminated a whole class of problems because everyone's sharing the same information. The other and kind of interesting new idea is this thing that's called a digital twin, which is representing every item on the blockchain with a sort of serial number level representation of the physical item. And that thing can be passed around to create a virtual world sort of that's in parallel to what's in the real world. That creates all sorts of really cool capabilities around traceability, where was this product and who was it moved between? And I'm going to mark this virtual apple to be paired with this real apple and see what farm it came from and see it move on the blockchain from the tree to the bushel, to the truck, to the distribution center, to the store, to the consumer with this idea of these digital twins. So those are kind of two different ideas of data that both can use the same underlying technology. And as you mentioned there, there's a lot of transactions. And as you mentioned at the beginning, there's so much data that clients are trying to pull in now, but it ends up on spreadsheets. It's not cross-departmental, and there's really not a single source of truth in most companies. So how important, though, is clean data and bringing all of this stuff to the future health of your supply chain, especially if you want to use emerging technologies like AI or a TMS system or a blockchain system? So clean data is the holy grail. And it's the foundation that every AI company starts from. I was just on a panel last week at the uh, Journal of Commerce conference about AI, and I was the only one who didn't have an AI company on the panel. And I was talking about clean data and this idea that companies need to start worrying about that problem really two years ago. But if they haven't, start worrying about it now. And all of these other CEOs were saying, yeah, we expect you to have clean data if you want to be able to use our tool and that their dirty little secret inside of a lot of their companies is they're spending massive amount of time just cleaning up their customers' data. And so if you want to be able to do things with advanced technology, you have to understand the data that's in your environment and understand how it needs to be represented so that you can share it and give it out. And then blockchain makes that a thousand times worse because it's It's writing things in ink, not in pencil. And especially on the service provider side of the house, there was always kind of the game of, we'll get the data in however it is. And by the time we have to do the quarterly review with the client, we'll go in and make sure everything's clean. Well, now you're going to say, as the data is coming in, everyone sees it and I can never go back and hide the little mess in my work. So that's a much scarier proposition. Amazing. I mean, especially in an AI system, you put bad data in, When you start having something using intelligence, using bad data, it's a computer. The results could be bad, man. I don't know if it's going to be Skynet, but it's not going to work out. (laughs) It's actually worse. It's worse than most people think because one of the scary things with a lot of the newer neural networks, you don't necessarily get a nice pretty picture of how it came to its conclusion. So you may be putting inadvertently be putting bad or biased data in and it's not obvious when it comes out that that was the cause. It's not, it's not a, an arithmetic problem that you can walk backwards and find the source. There was an example recently in the news with Amazon where they had a HR system and they found out that the AI HR system was, was extremely biased in the same way as their humans because they were using their historical hiring data as the source. And The same thing can happen in your supply chain. If you've been making bad decisions or having bad data for a long period of time, those same issues are going to show up in the conclusions the AI engine makes. I was at the Connect TNT conference. This isn't a tech-focused logistics conference. It's like straight up, mostly deals with the compliance. But they had a forum there on blockchain, and it should have been called mental blockchain because the second they said the word blockchain, you could just see people's eyes glazing over. (laughs) People are really confused by this. But, it was, you know, to me, it was eye-opening. My eyes weren't glazed over. I was looking around, though, at everyone else, and I was thinking to myself, you know what? We need to present this in a way to people that it relates to them. So my question to you is, let's talk in shippers' term. If I am a shipper, how does blockchain relate to me? What's the practical use of it? The concept of trust is important. Where you see something in your world that there is a low-trust environment. 
that is an opportunity to look and say, if I had a system that was perfectly transparent and perfectly auditable, would that help me? And forget the tech, forget all the things about permission and private and public and consensus mechanisms. All of that stuff is for the IT people to figure out. Areas where if you see an auditor today or a bank in the middle of something, those are the places to go say, could I make that auditor's job easier if the information was more transparent? So uh, there's companies like Cargo X who are looking at blockchain-based bill of lading, right? So that you're not trying to trace this physical piece of paper around the world. You've got companies looking at things like uh, letters of credit or compliance data. So if I'm capturing harvest certificates for wood products on the blockchain and allocating out how much wood in my supply chain is coming from each provider and creating a digital twin for each uh, you know, square foot or, or cubic meter, depending on <laughs> what your product is of wood, then you can trace that through and hand that back to your social compliance auditors so that they have more traceability. So, so I look at it as you start with the idea of trust, identify where you have low trust, either with a service provider or with somebody who might actually be trying to do something bad, and then walk forward from that, and then let the tech people figure out whether blockchain is the right solution. Ultimately, my where this ends is the same place that every other piece of tech ends, which is it fades into the background. I don't think there's a CEO in the uh, in any industry at this point who can tell you what build and version number of Oracle is supporting their accounting system database because it's just a piece of tech. Five years from now, that's where blockchain should be. And the people doing blockchain practitioner work should be at tech conferences, not at supply chain conferences. You know, I agree with you. I was reading an article on LinkedIn about 30 minutes before we got on the air. And this article was aimed at young people advising them on joining supply chain and what jobs and what career paths they can go in. Not once in this entire article was technology mentioned, which I thought was insane. And I had to call it out because anybody who's in school now, they need to at least have a cursory understanding of AI, IoT, blockchain, and supply chain digitization if they want to be in this field. Because as you and I both know, there's a lot of people in managerial positions right now who have no understanding of this and they're not doing enough to gain an understanding of it. So if you're a student, you can get a leg up pretty quickly by focusing on that. Yeah. And I think the the trick is to figure out what is it that you want to do with that knowledge? Because the, if you want to be a supply chain practitioner, you should understand the technology the same way that I understand how my car works, right? I know what the parts are. I know how they work, but you certainly don't want me opening up the hood or going into the computer system inside my car. I'm not a mechanic. Now, if you want to do that, if you want to be a deeply technical person, that's great and, and learn that stuff. But I think you should at least know, you know, this is the role of the tires. This is the role of the engine. And I should know what the transmission is so that somebody can't scam me later when I do go to a mechanic. Well said. You don't have to even know how to drive stick, right? right? <laughs> just, you just need the manual understanding. Key goes in, gas goes in. You know, put it in drive, gas and brake, but understand what it does and the function within your supply chain and how it interrelates to the core functions that are going on behind the scene. IBM, they came on this show to talk about their blockchain, and they've published quite a few use studies of blockchain. It's found some footing in food and pharma supply chains. I even read an interesting article on how blockchain is being used in Canada to trace the chain of custody of marijuana purchases. I was actually on that <laughs> panel. Were you on that panel? <laughs> the day before legalization at the Tiaka conference. Yes. <laughs> so. I mean, it's amazing stuff, but it makes so much sense. So you've been out there. You're at this panel. I'd imagine that blockchain, for example, would be very beneficial to someone like cargo insurance providers as it provides a single source of truth and chain of custody, right? So we're actually in the very early phases of a project around using blockchain to help resolve insurance claims as far as proof of condition at origin and at destination. And there's a, a very cool company out there right now called Peer, who is doing a similar type of work on actually trailer condition. So getting photographs as a trailer enters and exits a yard just to resolve damage claims around the physical trailers coming in and out 
and you know where where was that trailer when it got damaged and who's responsible so yeah that's absolutely a, a really strong use case yeah i think for food for the drugs for insurance it makes so much sense but what other industries do you think stand to gain the most by you know getting an early start with blockchain the big one for me and i i also kind of come from that compliance background is social compliance and supplier management and being able to really do two things with blockchain. One is make sure that you're keeping an auditable, transparent trail. And there's a lot of companies out there, especially in apparel right now, who are trying to make their tra supply chains more transparent. And there's nothing more transparent than actually writing the information to a public ledger as you're, as you're putting that information out there. But also on the sense that there are companies looking at issuing certifications on the blockchain. So saying things uh, like, I'm going to go out as a third party and audit the social compliance and labor situations at a factory and issue that factory a certificate on the blockchain that they can then provide to their customers to say that they've been audited and it's provable. So that way, every apparel company in the world doesn't have to go visit the same factory and run their own audit because that factory can, without the middleman, just provide them a, a key, essentially, to unlock a certificate that proves that, that they've been audited and that's all traceable. So I think there's a, a the upstream vendor management. There's huge opportunities there uh, in that space. When should a company, if a shipper sitting here listening to this, when should they consider a blockchain solution? Is there a prime example? Is there a time you shouldn't consider it? I mean, we mentioned data. You should probably try to clean your data up first and, you know, maybe get that in order and then get to blockchain. But what, in your opinion, how would you advise a company thinking to get into blockchain? In most cases, unless you're the biggest of the big, uh, unless you're Walmart, IBM, Maersk, et cetera, I would say, wait, give it another year let some of these things shake out. There's uh, huge investments that are going to be thrown away at the end of this, sort of like the companies that invested in building MP3 players before the iPhone hit. So we're early days. The other thing I would caution is don't put blockchain in the middle of a mission critical project. <laughs> so if you have something that you, if you have a corporate initiative, right? So you want to uh, reduce your, you know, time to delivering. You've made commitments to the public market that you're going to do that. That's not the place to put a, a, a cutting edge experimental technology. I learned a great lesson in an interview that I heard on NPR many years ago when the first Mars rovers landed, and they they asked, "Well, what's the cool moonshot tech that's going to come out of this?" And the the commander who was being interviewed said, "Everything that was on that rover existed." 20 years ago in your home because we wanted things that were proven and things that were stable. There's not going to be blockchain on the next rover that goes out there either. It's, um, it's cutting edge. It should be used for experimental things, things where you're okay going back to your boss and saying that money all just went down the drain. Uh, and there are very few companies that are open to that, but those that are, uh, you know, they're going to, they're going to let them make that investment and then get in on generation two is usually the right answer for the vast majority of companies. I think what you said is going to resonate and make a lot of sense with shippers because, you know, the feedback I hear is, well, how do I use this now? And, you know, they seem a little unaware, or unsure, and they should. It's natural to feel unsure about something like this. It's an emerging tech. Don't be a beta tester just by dipping your toe in the water because even the big companies doing it, they're segmenting this stuff. Even the biggest companies that are getting involved that are all in on blockchain are still not running their entire supply chain on it. They're doing use case studies in, in the food supply chain and only a very minimal part of their supply chain in a controlled environment, correct? No, I will say I may need some extra security outside my office because all of the blockchain startups are going to be uh, <laughs> outside my door with pitchforks uh, hearing that, that they're going to have to burn cash for another year before anybody signs up. But uh, at the end of the day, that's probably still, still advice I stand by. Yeah, well, nobody will be there in a year, though, if they sign up too early before this is ready for prime time either. Shippers bring on TMS technology and don't use it properly. They bring on blockchain technology. They're going to say this costs a lot of money. It's not doing anything. And the next thing you know, blockchain is a dead technology and out the door. So I think you're actually doing the industry a service, even if they do have to burn through their money, because you're properly marketing and selling the product. And, and I will say that we do have to be cautious uh, in the hype cycle that as we enter or are in the trough of disillusionment where we all got all super excited last year and then we're going to be all really depressed next year, 
Now, the reality is there are amazing potential uses for this technology. They just are not going to happen in the first quarter of 2019. So, you know, as long as people have level set expectations, it's something sh people should be tracking. They should be watching these projects and ultimately starting to get in involved at some point. But don't think that it's a quick fix. When we built our tool, which was uh, we started about a year ago, a project that we scoped that if we did it off blockchain would have taken us maybe a week or two, took six months. Technology sort of moving around underneath us as we were trying to implement on top of it. And in the long run, I'm very bullish on the tech. Just people have to go in with their eyes open. Brian, I have to admit to a little bit of a sin here. I was on LinkedIn and I saw you, a video of you talking from the airport in Las Vegas. You were just at a conference that I would love to have gone to, the JOC Supply Chain Innovation and Tech Conference. Tell me a little bit about that, because we're very underserved here in New England for the tech and supply chain conferences. Though, little secret, I hope to change that by next year. But how did this conference go? That was uh, honestly one of the best conferences I've been to all year and maybe in several years. You know, just kind of get on my soapbox a little bit about conferences. The best ones are the ones where people are there to learn and to, to share information with each other. Uh, and when you're able to get tech people together run by an organization that really is independent and isn't looking to kind of gouge everyone and, and have a lot of paid speakers and what have you, there was huge amounts of information shared. Uh, and you know, on the AI front and the blockchain front, you were hearing probably a lot of similar things as I'm talking about today, which was kind of a measured approach and not the vendor hype cycle of, you know, getting somebody up in front of a 80 foot screen who shows you how the entire world economy is going to be shifted in the next 24 months by insert technology X. I've been seeing that presentation since XML in the nineties was going to change the universe, right? I get a little burnout on that stuff, but uh, the JOC uh, did a, a really, really great job with getting the right people to that event and, and really making it so we didn't all have to filter through the BS. And former guest, Eric Johnson, he helped put that show together, didn't he? He was, Eric was the star of the show. <laughs> uh, that was really his baby. And, uh, you know, Eric is, uh, is, is really one of the, the few people in, in the, on the journalism side of this uh, industry who, who I really look at everything he writes and, and everything he says, because he's, He's certainly plugged in. Yeah, he and I had some good crack, as the uh, the Irish would say. Not, not. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but so, but what was the talk at the conference? You you mentioned off the air there was a lot of talk about AI. AI seems to be sending a lot of speakers to tech and innovation. They really want the AI systems pushed into supply chain. But get away from the noise and the hype. What what did you take out of that conference, and what kind of innovations did you like hearing? So where we are getting is to a spot where we're not talking about technologies in theory anymore, especially around AI. So what was very cool at the conference was there were different software providers, uh, and I haven't personally vetted a lot of their software, so I'm not gonna, not gonna mention a lot of them by name, but they were talking about specific solutions, right? So using AI to do route optimization or using AI to optimize your carrier negotiations, where we're not talking about what is AI and how is AI uh, a thing so much as this is what we specifically are bringing to market that solves a problem with an ROI that you can put in front of your CFO. And looping back to blockchain, blockchain's behind that in that same cycle. So the things that you're hearing, if you're hearing about AI now, somebody should be talking to you about a specific ROI that you can put in front of your CFO and feel good about. Blockchain will be there, my guess, a year, two years, something like that. Uh, but that's kind of where those two technologies, uh, one is a little ahead of the other. And I kind of feel bad sometimes for the AI people that people say AI and blockchain, like it's a thing that, you know, they're two buzzwords that so they just put them next to each other alphabetically, but they're not at the same point in their evolution. Wow. So you, <laughs> you kind of told shippers to, to hold back a little bit on blockchain. So my question to you then is what's on the horizon for Chain.io and how are you going to feed yourself over the next year or two? Well, so interesting or important thing to know about Chain.io, probably the thing I have to remind people the most is that we registered the domain name in 2009. So this is, we are not a blockchain company. We have a product that uses the blockchain, but we are a systems integration company. 
And systems integration means uh, a TMS talking to an accounting system. It means uh, a legacy system at an automotive OEM talking to a modern new API implementation at a manufacturer. It means participating in a blockchain pilot because the big parent company is making you do it and figuring out how to make that work. So blockchain is 5% maybe of the projects that we're talking to people about. AI is maybe 20%. And then maybe the other 75% is traditional. Let's just figure out how to move data around in this business and get work done. And ultimately, we're trying to be very pragmatic and say, Getting work done is the goal, and the tech is all secondary to um, to that to that objective. So, if you're a shipper though, and you haven't even like really thought about su- well, you're starting to think about supply chain digitization, but you haven't really done anything yet. What would you say your steps are before you can get to something like AI, which seems kind of like near the end of of your goals, right? You're going to need a lot of clean data system integration and a bunch going on. But what would your roadmap kind of be? So, step one in my mind is to understand where you're getting your data from and make sure that you're getting it in a way that you can reuse it for other purposes. So if your data is going directly from a 3PL into a transportation management system and then you don't really have a way of intercepting it and using it for other purposes, that's a structure that you're going to have to break down and that's very common. Or even if your data is locked up in a supplier system or in a in a transportation provider system, that doesn't give you the flexibility. So the first piece to me is saying these are all the core things, right? This is where we know we can represent our purchase order. This is where we can represent our warehouse receipts. This is where we can represent our commercial invoices. Just that 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 really fundamental kind of if you if you were doing it all on paper, what would those documents look like? And do you have access to the data that would be on those paper documents in a way that you can do different things with it without having to ask permission of one of your vendors? If you can get there to where the data, you are you are in control and ownership of your data, then when the AI company comes to you, it's an incremental improvement to say, we have to reformat and funnel and move that data over there. But I think right now, a lot of shippers, either they don't have that data at all, And they're just waiting for a report at the end of the month or end of the quarter during a business review, or they have that data, but it's kind of trapped or siloed inside of systems where it's very expensive to get it out. And that's really step number one. Once you've done that, then you can start saying, okay, now that I have this data, let me go survey the marketplace, look at all these startups, look at all of these companies that say they're bringing new ideas or new ways of doing things, and then do the traditional hard work of justifying ROIs and you know, really making sure that they're bringing value and that, that they're not just the next shiny new object. Finally, you kind of pair those things together and then you have projects. Brian, you've said some great stuff today, some really interesting stuff. So if our guests want to follow up with you, how do they get in touch with you? How do they get to your site? I mean, <laughs> the name of your site's right in there. We said it a few times, but throw some plugs at us. So chain.io is the is the place to start. Uh, real easy, C H A I N dot I O, and uh, we have a nice get in touch form on the bottom of every page. Uh, we also follow us on LinkedIn. That is where we put a hundred percent of our updates, what shows we're going to be at, uh, what new things we're thinking about, any blog posts we put out there. Uh, we'll be we're actually starting up our own podcast, which will be first episode will be released shortly after. Uh, this airs and uh, where we're going to be profiling a lot of the partners, uh, different companies that we're working with that that have uh, interesting people. And we're focusing very heavily on the stories of people in our industry and their journeys and, and their thoughts about the industry. So that podcast uh, is actually already up on uh, on iTunes and, and the like. It's called Profiles by Chain.io. So that'll be out uh, by the time this airs. And uh everything else just go to linkedin or the website i love it man half my fa- my favorite episodes to do so like half of them are either biographies of people in supply chain or stuff like the history of the semi truck just cuz i you know i enjoy learning so much and i enjoy researching people and i enjoy researching topics and also i feel like the medium of podcasting it's not a webinar yep people are driving or they're jogging or they're at the gym they're not holding a pen and paper so you want to make interesting content to them and show them that you know supply chain you know there can be informative and fun too it's not just a bunch of compliance. Yep. And ultimately, the whole industry is still about people. And if we start with the people, then everything else takes care of itself. 
Speaking of fun, I know that you have a date with Red Dead Redemption 2. You okay, boy? I, full disclosure, this is where I'm way behind. I'm way behind you. I, this morning, I was installing Witcher 3 on my Xbox. I hope to play that when I get home. I don't know if you've played that one. It's an award-winning RPG. It's supposed I, to be great. I have, and I will say that the supply chain represented in a video game about 13th century Central Europe is uh, sort of inadequate for, uh, for today's world. But uh, oh. <laughs> I'm glad you're a fellow video game geek. Am I going to lose like 80 to 100 hours of my life in this thing? Well, more than that. Well, more oh than my. that. So uh, I'm in for it now. Sorry, honey. Hey, kid, why the moping? You're making the fish miserable. Apologize <laughs> to my wife in advance. Well, Brian, thank you so much for your time today. You've been an excellent guest. You're a great speaker, and you're out there doing the Lord's work, evangelizing the power of data in the supply chain. I'm well, happy to help out. Would you come back in the future to keep us up to date on Chain.io and the future of blockchain and, and all this great information you're picking up at conferences? Anytime. Anytime at all. Awesome, man. And, and I may have something for you in October of next year. I can't announce it yet. I'll give you some details when I know, though, but it'll be in Boston and it'll involve tech and the supply chain. Well, any, any opportunity I have uh, as a Yankees fan to go to Boston is uh, 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 an opportunity that, that I unfortunately can't turn down. So Ooh. we'll just leave it with that. <laughs> you and my dad both. My dad's from New York. He uh, grew up in Brooklyn as a kid. He grew up a Yankees fan. And um, yeah, he keeps that a little bit on the down low around here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brian, have a great weekend. Take care. And thanks again for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Looking to modernize, digitize, and future-proof your supply chain? Visit dayone.io for a free day one data optimization report. That's day. That's day, the number zero, the number one, dot I-O. Isn't it time you got optimized? For this episode and all of our previous shows, head on over to consultinglogistics.io or simply search Consulting Logistics on your favorite podcast player of choice. Questions, comments, and guest bookings, email me at tdooner at abornandco.com. That's T-D-O-O-N-E-R at abornandco.com. I'd be happy to learn something new with you. And we have a listener mail episode coming up soon. So if you have any burning questions, send them my way to that email address. Well, we're out of time, folks. For Brian Glick, this has been Tim Dooner saying take care and happy shipping!